Hi there, welcome to Father's House Online. Thank you for joining us. We're three weeks into the new year and we're in the depths of winter as if all the restrictions uh, and uh, drama and suffering that we're going through in the midst of this pandemic wasn't bad enough. We're now in the depths of winter, seeing heavy rain, wind and floods that's affecting people's lives and it's really difficult. So in times like this, let's not forget each other. Let's look out for each other. Let's not just pray for each other, but let's support each other practically wherever possible. Pick up the phone, Zoom call, FaceTime, do whatever you need to do, but keep in touch with people. Uh, make sure you look out for each other. And uh, if you're at home alone and you're struggling and you're thinking that nobody cares, can I suggest that maybe, maybe that you make the first move rather than think nobody cares about me. People do, but maybe they're unaware of the situation you're in. So pick up the phone, put something out on social media or just contact somebody via message or email and say, hey, I could really do with some help. There are loads of people around who would be glad to help. And uh, at Father's House, as part of the church across Lancaster and the Morecambe Bay area, we would be glad to help you in any way possible. We can pray for you. We're happy to talk to you uh, via message or over the phone or anything. And even if you need food, maybe we can help you there through our food cafe that feeds people who are struggling to feed themselves or their families that we run a couple of times a week. So don't suffer in silence. If you need help, please get in touch. But once again, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching us. Uh, we uh, we started a series uh, this year looking at miracles and then last week we moved on to a new series which we really begin today. It's about the Sermon on the Mount. But last year was like an introduction and uh, if you watched last week uh, you will have seen and heard that it was a whistle-stop tour through Bible history from creation right up until uh, when Jesus comes and how that is all fits in together, how it's all part of God's plan, how throughout history and biblical history, God always brings his plan back into place, even when uh, mankind tries to throw it off track. Uh, so God, uh, we, as we saw last week, pressed the reset button a number of times to keep his plan in place. And by the way, thank you for those people who have got in touch and given some feedback to say how much that has helped you and helped you understand how much you enjoyed that. Uh, we really do appreciate your comments. Uh, it's it's encouraging, it's helpful. And also if you have questions or doubts, get in touch. We'll do our best to answer them as well. But let's get back to uh, this week's message and this new series that we're going to do on the Sermon on the Mount. And before we start that proper, I just want to introduce it and the need for the Sermon on the Mount. And it links in with last week in the introduction. and why, It's why that was in, important and it's why I had to bring that. Because throughout history, as God's pressed the reset button, it's so they could start again with either one man or a small group of people uh, trying to restore that broken relationship between uh, us and God, mankind and God, so that can, God can bring about his plan of restoration and hope for all creation. And last week we saw that the, the, the last reset, the final reset, the great reset, if you will, was when uh, Jesus came and he was able to do what mankind was unable to do throughout history and biblical history. And uh, that God was implementing that plan through Jesus. And Jesus came uh, with this plan, with this mission. And the mission was simply this. He was to begin to bring in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And in doing so, Jesus started off by demonstrating what the kingdom of heaven was like, what it looks like. And he did it by revealing four things. And the first thing is this, the love of God. When Jesus was here on earth, and especially in his three years of ministry, that he began at the age of 30, he demonstrated the love of God. Uh, a couple of scriptures that you might want to check out. Uh, John three sixteen, 
For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So God paying the price, in demonstrating his love for us by sending his only Son. And uh, also have a look at 1 John 3, 1. The second thing is this, the presence of God. And we see that in John 14, 9. And that's where Jesus says to his disciples, his followers, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The third thing is the purity or holiness of God. And John chapter 6, verses 68 to 69 confirm this. Peter uh, responding to Jesus when most of his disciples have turned their backs and left Jesus because the task of following him was too hard. The uh, What Jesus was asking of them, the level of commitment and surrender and sacrifice, uh, which is only what he'd, he was doing and did, but they didn't want to do that, so they left. And Peter says uh, to him, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Then verse 69, we believe and know that you are the holy one, the pure one of God. And the fourth thing is the power of God. So there's the love of God, the presence of God, the purity or holiness of God, and then the power of God. And we see that in John chapter 10, verses 37 to and this is where Jesus is responding to those who doubt him, that he is God coming to establish his kingdom here on earth or the beginning of the kingdom. Because Jesus says the kingdom is yet to come and yet the kingdom is here. Uh, so it's it's one uh, and the other at the same time. And that could be difficult to understand. But Jesus came to bring in the kingdom. And the fourth thing where he, where he shows us the power of God in John 10, 37 to 38, says this, do, do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, because you're doubting who I am, because you think you know me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the now, Jesus did all of these things. We can see that very clearly in the four Gospels, Ma Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But he did more than that. He also did what uh, the God of relationship has always done. Reach out to people, a person or a small group of people, to press the reset button and begin God's plan to bring in his kingdom again. But on this occasion, or this time, Jesus chose not one person, but 12 disciples and then more, but initially 12. And he set them apart to follow him for a, a period of three years, his three years of ministry. And during that three year period, he used that time to mentor them or disciple them on how to be like him, how important that was, and to be able to do what he did so that the kingdom of God would be able to continue to grow even when Jesus returned home to be with his father. So, after calling his first disciples, which we can read about in Matthew chapter 4, and calling them to follow him, come follow me, which was the call of every rabbi, uh, and you can learn about that in a previous message that uh, I, I did on what that actually means. And I'll, I'll put the link up on this video so that you can see that but the he calls them uh, and then begins to start the mentoring or discipleship process and that's where we get to Matthew 5 and in the first two verses we see that it says now when he Jesus saw the crowds he went up on a mountainside or a hillside and he sat down and his disciples came to him because they were following him so wherever he went they went and then verse two says, and he began to teach them, saying, and this is where we move into the Sermon on the Mount, because this is the beginning of the discipling process or the mentoring process, if you will. And uh, the Sermon on the Mount is not just any ordinary message. Uh, it's way beyond that. Uh, as I, I think I, might, I mentioned last week, even Gandhi said it was the greatest message in history. And that is why it's so important for us to look afresh 
at this message of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, and to understand its purpose in our lives. And its purpose is very simple. Its purpose is to form our character, for our character to become more Christ-like. And as we're talking about character, I want to just tell you a, uh, a short story, uh, and this involves me. Uh, and some of you may know that as well as being a pastor, I have another role. I am a, a chaplain to the Army Cadet Force, uh, or Padre, if you will. And with this role, uh, I am blessed to have the privilege of being able to input into the lives of hundreds of young people, the cadets, as well as the staff the, and volunteers in the Army Cadet Force. But from time to time, uh, we get to go to army camps with the guests or what have you, or get to visit army camps as part of our chaplaincy training, if you will. And uh, I remember a few years ago going to visit with the Winchester Training Regiment and spending uh, some time there. And whilst there were some other uh, chaplains, padres, I learned that uh, for new recruits into the army, because it was an army training camp, that all new recruits have to spend six weeks. So out of their six months basic training uh, before they actually become a soldier, if you will, they have to spend the first six weeks in the classroom. And one of the things they have to do in the classroom is they have to learn about the character that is required for all uh, new recruits who are going to be, uh, are hoping to be a member of the armed forces. Why? Because on every mission, if you will, army mission, battle, every mission they go into, and in every situation, if, if they do become a member of the armed forces, every mission, every situation, they are representing something much bigger than themselves. Because now they, they will be representing their regiment. They will be representing the British army. And not just that, the British army represents the nation of Great Britain and its sovereign, uh, who is Queen Elizabeth II. So before they can have uh, any weapons, uh, get to handle any weapons and how to use them, or before they get involved in any combat training, hand-to-hand -hand combat training, they have to spend time in the classroom learning the importance from a, an army chaplain of the following six characteristics or values. And let me read them out to you. First one is courage. The second one is loyalty. The third one is discipline. The fourth one is integrity. The fifth one is selfless commitment. And the sixth and final one is respect for others. Just let me run through them again. Courage, loyalty, discipline, integrity, selfless commitment and respect for others. Imagine what the church could look like if we live by these values. And this is for the armed forces. And uh, I, I dare to dream of the difference it could make. And it's really interesting. Uh, I've taught on these values to the cadets a number of times. Uh, and uh, I, I decided to do a bit of teaching and a bit of a lesson on these values when I was a prison chaplain for 12 years. And so started to teach on them. And that le led me onto an idea to look at the character of Christ and therefore the character of a disciple and that is what I use when I disciple people uh, I have a list of 26 values or characteristics that should be in every disciple if we're like Christ and I use those when I disciple people and uh, it's great because character matters and you can get a lot out of it when you look into what we're meant to be like if we're going to be like Jesus. Because just like those new recruits who are hoping to become a member of the army, and just like any member of the armed forces, we too, if we are followers of Jesus, disciples, we represent something much bigger than each of us as individuals. We are part of the body of Christ, the church. 
So it, it's not just about us anymore. So whenever we go out on mission, in fact, every day is a mission. Every hour of every day is a mission. So at home, in the workplace, at uni, college, school, uh, wherever we are, we represent something much bigger than us. We're called to be salt and light wherever we are, and we'll come to that later in the Sermon on the Mount. Let us not forget that when we sign up to follow Jesus, we become Christ's ambassadors. And our mission is to expand the kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 18 to 20 says this, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, what Jesus did on the cross in restoring the relationship that we couldn't do by our own strength uh, and by our own morals because we're just not good enough. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So God reconciles us to himself through Jesus. Then he gives us the ministry of reconciliation. You know, we take on the mission to represent him. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin against them. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord that God doesn't count our sins against us, uh, but with forgiveness and mercy, he draws us to him if we'll receive that gift. And it says, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We're to carry on with that, with this mission. Then verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And we implore you, that's us, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. To be reconciled to God means we've drifted away and we have to come back to be reconciled, to be made right with God, to be in right, close and intimate relationship, not a distant relationship. And that's really important. And that's a point I'll come back to towards the end of this message. But this leads us nicely now to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, which is the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, verses 3 to 12. And I'll just read them to you now. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Within uh, the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 3 to 12, we see eight principles. There are eight different principles. And these eight principles are the very foundation of our character. So those six principles or values or characteristics uh, that uh, are taught to every new recruit in the armed forces, there are eight principles that Jesus wants to teach us which are the very foundation of our character as followers of Jesus, as disciples. And without having these values, principles, characteristics in place, we will struggle to be like Jesus and therefore be his disciples. And these principles are so important, so important, that even though I'm going to start to talk about them today and finish talking about them next week, we're actually going to come back to them uh, in much greater detail in the spring of this year, well, after Easter, uh, and just do one a week. But for now, we're going to have a brief look at them and what they mean to us as disciples or followers of Jesus. But the first thing to understand is that all eight principles or these character characteristics, they're all linked together. You can't have one without the other. And that each one builds on the one before it. So in that way, they're like the fruit of the Spirit. We often think of the fruit of the Spirit as the fruits of the Spirit because there's nine different things. But the Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't say fruits. It says fruit. All nine are linked, uh, if you can remember what they are. Love, joy, peace, patience, guide, good.
goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I think that's all nine. They're all linked. You can't have one without the other. And it's the same with the Beatitudes. These eight principles are all linked uh, and they all build on each other and you can't have one without the other. They can't be separated. Uh, if you want to check out the Fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. And these Beatitudes begin in verse 3 with the first one, which says, Blessed or blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But what does that mean? Well, let me try and explain what it means. And I've done a little bit of research here and forgive me if I go into the, the Greek language, but I'm trying to get the original meaning across of what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. Uh, and maybe for some of you, this could be a revelation. And some of the things I'm going to put to you, uh, I encourage you to go and check out because I'm bringing you my understanding. So please go and check it out, weigh it up. But the word poor here in this context, the poor in spirit, the word poor here means to be in poverty. Uh, the Greek translation uh, says it's literally to be a beggar, like we would see a homeless, a street person, someone with no means of feeding themselves or getting themselves out of the mess that they have found themselves in. Very interesting. Poor is not just being short, it's to have literally of nothing, to have hit rock bottom, the bottom of the pile, in, in the gutter. This is poor in spirit. And the word spirit is the Greek word pneuma. And that means breath, our very breath, the breath that keeps us alive. So it means our very life. It also means our soul which is our very being. Our soul is deep down who we are as individuals, who God's created us to be. The body, you know, this body will come and go, but our soul will always have that because that is who we are. So what Jesus is saying is this, and I'm paraphrasing. He says, contented and satisfied will be those who come to me broken, who have hit rock bottom, who can do nothing in their own strength. Their own skills, they've run out, they've got nothing to offer me. Great, because now I can help you. How great is that? That Jesus saying, you know, blessed are you to be in that position. It might not seem like a blessing, but now that you've got to a place where you admit you can't do it, you can't help yourself, is the point where I can step in and help you. Because it's not by as the Bible says, it's not by might and not by power, but my Holy Spirit, says the Lord. And I believe this is a place where all of us must start our relationship with God. I don't care if you've been a Christian 30 years. If this is not in place, this is the real beginning. You know, all the Jews thought they knew God. But this is a real beginning. This is why it's so important what Jesus is teaching here. This is a place where... I believe we must all start our relationship with God. Brokenness, humbleness, humility. But I'm going to suggest something else here. I also believe there's a place to which each of us must return again and again and again throughout our journey of following Jesus. Why do I say that? Because even with the best will in the world, and just let me speak for myself here, uh, you can speak for yourself, but I'm going to speak for myself and give you some Bible references to try and back up what I'm saying, but you're free to disagree and to check it out. But even with the best will in the world, I, we, forget how much we need him. When things are going well, we forget how much we need him. And uh, me being human, like many people in the Bible, we default even after all the great things God has done. And you mean to think that's not me. Well, we always think like that when things are going well. But can you remember when things haven't been going well and the things you might have said about God and not so nice things about God and other people and you've really struggled and whatever. But the thing is this, we soon forget about God, even if we try not to, and how much we need him. 
and we de we default to doing things uh, our way with our intellect our skills and in our own strength and that might seem okay but do you know what that is that's religion religion is man's way of getting to god but god's not interested in religion god's interested in relationship and god has provided a way for us to get to him to be reconciled to him and that was jesus and the holy spirit so it will never be about our gifts our strength how huge our church is or anything like that all as good and great as all those things are it's a laying down it's a surrendering you know check out romans 12 1 and 2 where it really begins so the the beginning is brokenness but i also believe it's not just the beginning it's something we need to return to again and again and again but if we admit and keep admitting and this is a good place to be that we that without god that we cannot live a life of holiness the standard that god requires or being set apart and we stop trying to lift ourselves up to a position of prominence hey look at me super christian uh, either on social media or in church but instead humble ourselves you know what's that prayer in chronicles is it 2 chronicles seven eleven? if my people will humble themselves and pray uh, if we will instead humble ourselves and cry out to jesus cry out cry out to him saying i'm at the end of my tether i'm broken i've realized i i don't care the fact that i'm a pastor i've realized i'm a mess and i can't do this then jesus hears our cries as god has done throughout history and if we ask him to fill us with the power of his Holy Spirit, he will do that. And that will enable us to become more like Jesus. But not just that, God also does something even more amazing as part of his divine exchange in return. He promises that the kingdom of heaven will be because ours. Because when it says, uh, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. What it means is that when we come with an attitude of brokenness and humility, it says that Jesus, God, will lift us up. And ultimately, he'll lift us up, not just out of the pit, but he will lift us up into a position where we will rule and reign with him because we have humbled ourselves before him. And because we've humbled ourselves before him, it's no longer about us, it's about him and his glory. And therefore... Because we're not trying to make a name for ourselves. We can be trusted with power and authority. If you want a bit of a biblical uh, proof of this. Well this is exactly what happened to Joseph in Genesis. Read Genesis 37 and then Genesis 39 to 41. G God uses Joseph. He gives him dreams and says this is how I'm going to use you. But Joseph with his youth and arrogance and lack of tact. Maybe he doesn't start off so well. So what happens is through circumstances, I'm not saying God did it, but through circumstances, he ends up at rock bottom. And in that, God teaches him uh, and works on his character whilst he's at rock bottom in prison, forgotten, abandoned by family, friends, and even people he's helped out have not returned the favour to help him out. And yet in all that, God is, is forming his character. Uh, and then you see that God actually... God lifts him up and puts him in a position of power and authority where he rules over the whole land and people's lives and livelihoods are in the palm of Joseph's hand. But now he can be trusted because God used the difficult times to work on his character. He had to be brought or humbled, brought to, that, to rock bottom where God could say, right now I can work on you and I can work on your character so that you will be fit to rule and reign on my behalf and show people my glory. Now, the second principle or beatitude is this, and it's in Matthew 5, 4. It says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And I often wondered about this verse. Uh, is Jesus talking about those uh, who were family or friends, partners, have died and they're mourning and Jesus will be there to comfort them. Yes, I believe that. Our God is a, is a, a comforter. The Holy Spirit, one of his titles is the comforter. But 
I want to suggest that maybe it's more than that. Now, to mourn, you know, we mourn when we have lost someone or something, but generally someone. We mourn when we've lost someone that we love. Therefore, we cannot mourn for the loss of something or someone that we never had or never loved. You can't mourn the loss of something or someone if you've never had that something or that someone. And also, if you didn't love somebody, the chances are you're not going to mourn losing them because you're probably glad to get rid of them. I know that's not a great thing to say, but it's true. <laughs> if you didn't love somebody, you're probably glad to see the back of them. Uh, I'm not going to go into the rights or the wrongs of that. The point is we mourn the loss of someone that we have loved. And when we lose someone, uh, something, but in particular, someone whom we loved, someone who we believe uh, we cannot do without, that they were such a part of our life that in a way they completed us and now we're a lesser being. When we lose someone we love, that we really loved, it is natural as human beings to mourn and to grieve. And that's what I want to focus on. Because the mourning here that uh, Jesus is talking about is literally grieving. But who or what is Jesus talking about when he says that we're, you know, blessed are those who are mourned? Who or what are we mourning the loss of? And I want to suggest to you today that what we're mourning the loss of here that Jesus is talking about is the loss of a loving close and intimate relationship with Jesus, with God himself. Why do I say that? Well, bear with me. If stage one is being poor in spirit, and that's when we truly begin our close relationship with God, then I, I believe, I want to suggest that stage two, the mourning, is the grief that we suffer, or at least should suffer, when that relationship is broken and it's always broken by us it's never broken by God it's broken by us you might think I'm going out on a limb and is there any evidence to support this theory of mine I believe there is and let me put it to you and it's evidence from the Bible because when I read the Bible I see that time and time again that the people of God corporately the group of the people of God Israel turned away from their close relationship after all the amazing things that God had done for them after every reset where God made things right and saved them they began to drift away from their close relationship with God and slide further and further down until they hit rock bottom and were completely lost from him then when they hit rock bottom they begin to cry out they literally begin to mourn and grieve the loss of that relationship and for God to be restored to them or for them, whichever way you want to look at it, for them to be restored to him. But it's not just corporately as a people. You see examples of this personally. One of the greatest examples that we see is with King David, where King David, uh, whom God described as a man after his own heart. God says, I love this man. And yet if you look at his life, he sins Big time, he messes up big time. Not just adultery, he has somebody murdered, he has a sadistic streak, he makes bad judgment calls. And yet in all that, he's still one of the forerunners, one of the people that points to what the Messiah Jesus will look like. And yet we see in Psalm 51, David grieving. Read the psalm. It's a psalm of grief, of having a lost and broken relationship and crying out, for that to be restored and David's like I, look I don't care what it costs but I need you I need your presence I need your Holy Spirit back that's all that matters he's grieving for the loss of God's presence the Holy Spirit and that's why I want to suggest that stage two blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted is something that happens to all of us and that's why I said that you know, that we would have to return. It's not only the beginning of our relationship to come in humbleness and brokenness. I believe it's a place that we have to return to again and again and again on our journey with Jesus because we do drift. 
That's human nature. Now, maybe you don't. And if you don't, if you've never drifted, praise God. You know, that, 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 I praise God for you. There's not many people like you. But I have. I have many times. And I'm deeply, deeply sorrowful for it. But I can't change what I've done. I can only cry out to God. I can only mourn for where the relationship has begun to slide and been lost. And I just want to finish by looking at this whole thing a little bit now, further. Now, if you uh, are in a great place and you think, well, I've never slipped or lost my relationship with God, fantastic. But can I say to you, just be very careful if you believe that. Be very, very careful because that's almost a very arrogant statement to make. Uh, because if we can't admit that we have lost our close loving relationship with Jesus, uh, even when it's evident that we have, we may not see it, but you guarantee you that other people around you can see it. But if we can't see it and can't admit it, then we're in trouble. Is that possible? You know, can we be moving in the things of God, believing that we're close to God and yet be a million miles away? I believe it is. Why do I believe that? Because the Bible tells me. Here are some scriptures for you to check out. Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23, and Matthew chapter 4, and Matthew chapter 25. Please read them and have a look to check out what I'm saying. But for those of us who are humble, humble being broken, poor in spirit, hitting rock bottom, who are humble enough to admit that they have lost their first love, just like the church in Ephesus did. Remember Jesus' letter to the seven churches, Revelation 2, 1 to 5. In fact, let me just read that to Jesus you Jesus says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write this. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. This is the churches. I know your deeds. In other words, I know everything about you. I know your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men. You know, you're so holy that you don't want to be around wicked people and that you have been tested and you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false and that you have endured, you have persevered and endured many hardships for my name's sake and yet have not grown weary. That's all good news up to now. But we get to verse four. And yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. So in spite of all the great things that they've done, they're uh, doing, Jesus is saying, and yet you've drifted from me. You've forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. See where that ties in with the scriptures of Matthew 7, 21 to 23 and Matthew 24 to 25 so Jesus is saying repent do the things that you did at first if the first thing you did was come into relationship and we've now fallen out of love which is what he's saying to a whole church here then we have to go back and start again and this is why I said we have to return to stage one of the Beatitudes again and again and again and again but the good news is if we can be humble enough to admit that we have messed up we have drifted away we've lost our first love that there is hope there is hope for us. So when Jesus talks about this mourning, how can we know if we are in mourning, if we are mourning the loss of our relationship with that we have with Jesus? In other words, how can we know that we've lost our first love? What are the signs? Are there any signs? Uh, and you may think there are loads of signs, but I think there are very some, some very clear signs. And I want to point them out to you. Because Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. Those who mourn are those who grieve. And there are, there are signs that we can recognise. There are five, grief has five stages. Five stages from the beginning of grief to before it gets better. And these are signs that we can look out for to help us understand where we're at, to get back to our first love, to get back to that place of brokenness and just... Uh, beginning that relationship again, if you will, from the merciful God of whose mercies are new every morning. 
Stage one is this denial. And I'll just quickly go through these because this is something I say we'll come back to in more detail later in the year. Signs of denial are avoidance, confusion, not really knowing where you are or where you're at or what to believe or what's true anymore. Elation, in other words, high one minute and low the next. You know, you can't be really high unless you've been really low. Shock, how did I get here? What's happened? And fear, oh, oh no, no, I don't know what to do. Uh, I, I'm afraid that I, I can never be rescued or saved. I'm not good enough after what I've done. God doesn't want me. So that's one, denial. Avoidance, confusion, elation, shock and fear. Stage two of grief is anger. And this is where we see frustration, which can lead to irritation and anxiety. You know, worry. Stage three is bargaining. What does bargaining look like? Where it's, it's where we're struggling to find meaning in life, our relationship with God, where we fit in, what our future looks like. It's at times like this we find ourselves uh, reaching out to others for help, uh, wanting to tell our story uh, in the hope that somebody will understand us uh, and just trying to make sense of things. Stage four is depression and signs of depression are that feelings of being overwhelmed, of complete helplessness, of hostility. You know, we, you, you almost find yourself battling with people and things and God. And also uh, we see in that flight. I recognise this trait in myself sometimes. There's times where I think, that's it, I'm a pastor, get me out of here. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I can't do it. I can't, I can't be me. You know, I'm a useless father, I'm a useless husband, I'm a useless pastor, I'm a useless friend. What's the point? You know, uh, I'm leaving to go and live somewhere else and start again. Uh, and these feelings, we have to recognise them, they're real. And you can beat yourself up as a Christian. Think, I shouldn't feel like that, I'm a Christian. I should have nice, happy, fluffy feelings all the time. But that's not real life. And until we recognise it, and if we don't recognise it, we can't deal with it. These feelings are normal. We have to accept that. But good news, stage five is acceptance. And acceptance is where we begin to explore our options for moving forward. And we think, right, all is not lost. We start looking at how to put a new plan in place that can help us move on and leave that past and the grief behind. So let me finish with this. If you have got to the place whether you realise that you need Jesus in your life or if, like me, that you can see that you need Jesus back in your life, being able to admit that your relationship isn't what it used to be. And I'm happy to admit that. I'm happy to admit that as a pastor. It's my relationship with Jesus isn't where I want it to be. It's not where it used to be. I've let things get in the way of which I take the blame for. Uh, but I'd rather do that than kid myself that everything's OK. So if you got to the place where you need Jesus in your life or like me, you can see you need him back in your life, uh, not as a distant level, but on a close and intimate level, then guess what? Good news. If you're at that stage either for the first time or the hundred and first time because you've let your life slip. Good news. You are blessed, said Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Because when you're in that stage and you cry out, say, God help me, God help me. The God of comfort comes to meet us where we're at. Why? Because our God is merciful, which is one of the things we'll look at next week. Let me finish with a scripture that I think just sums up these two verses, blessed are the poor in spirit who have hit rock bottom, God will lift you up. And blessed are those who are mourning, uh, for you will be comforted. Job 5.11 says this, the lowly, those at rock bottom, he, God, sets on high. And those who mourn are lifted to safety. What an amazing God. What an amazing God he is. And it's, it's why 
It doesn't matter how bad things get in my life or how far I drift, I'll come back to him again and again. Because like Peter, where else can I go? Who else can I go? Because my Saviour has the words of eternal life. And I pray that you will find that too. If it's for the first time, if like me, you just need to come back saying, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. Help me. May you be blessed. Take care. See you next week. Bye.